This is 21st Century Reformation at 21stcr.org. I've come to appreciate something that I didn't always know. And that is that God was very deliberate in his design of the church, what he wanted. He had specific determinations and, and, and thoughts in mind for how he wanted his body of people to exist and to be. The son that he sent, the son that he begat in the Virgin Mary, was precious indeed in his sight. And when that son, when his son, shed his blood so that a church, as well, I think it's the Apostle Paul, isn't it, says the glorious church <laughs> that he died for could come into being. That meant something to God because that life of his son is precious in God's sight. It meant something to him. And that the fact that his son would die for a people means something to God. So he doesn't take it lightly. And neither should anyone else, and particularly those of us in our current day, in our current age, that want to be part of the church of Jesus Christ, we shouldn't take that lightly either. John, the 17th chapter, is a recording of Jesus' prayer right on the eve of, right on the cusp of the time that will come when Jesus is going to sacrifice himself. He is going to be crucified for that church we're talking about. And he prays for that church. And picking up in the verse, uh, verse 17 of John chapter 17, you remember that he says in prayer, Jesus to his Father, sanctify them in the truth. Now, sanctify is a little bit of a fancy word, but it really just, just basically means to set aside or to set apart. Uh, generally, the impetus for that being not just to set aside, but to set aside for a purpose. Everybody understand that? For a purpose, for a particular use. Sanctify to, to set aside for a particular reason or, or purpose or determination. There's, there's a reason behind, behind it. Not just separatism uh, for its own sake, but separate for a purpose or, or, or sometimes even as a result of a particular cause. Now, in this case... Jesus says, sanctify them in your truth. That is to say, the truth that the Father has, the truth that God provides, will itself serve as the means by which the people that Jesus is praying for, which are his disciples, that his people might be set apart. He's saying, he's asking his Father, he's saying in prayer, he's saying, Father, set them apart but he's telling, he's being very specific in, in what his request is, in your truth. So the truth of God, that that God determines is true. The Apostle Paul at one, at one point makes this ex, exclamation. Remember how he says, you know, uh, let every man be a liar, but let God be true. It's, it's, a, it's a way uh, uh, of expressing that, you know, if we have hope, and if anybody knows what true is, it ought to be, God, right? So in, in another context, Paul's using, using that, that phrase. But, but I think the, the aspect is still, it, it, the, uh, the impetus of it is still true. God, if anyone knows what truth is, it ought to be God. And so Jesus, in prayer to the Father, he's saying, set my people apart in truth. And then, and then notice what he, what he then further goes on to establish. Your word is truth. Your word is truth. Jesus is saying, if anybody knows uh, what truth is, what right and wrong is, it's you, Father. He's addressing his Father in prayer. He's saying, your word is truth. And what he's asking for his people, for his disciples is, that they would be set apart, but not just for the sake of, uh, of separation in and of itself, but separation for purpose and by, in, and through the Word of God, the truth of God. He goes on to say, As you have sent me into the world, 
So there we see a, a comparison that Jesus is making between his own being sent out into the world and his disciples being sent out into the world. Between his sending forth of his disciples and what God did in sending him forth into the world. What did God send his son into the world with? A message. Is that not, is that not true? He came forth with a message. He came forth with a proclamation. He came forth preaching. What did he preach? He preached the gospel. He preached the kingdom of God. He preached redemption. He preached truth. He preached righteousness. He preached this is how God sees it. And this is how we ought to reconcile ourselves to God. Is that not all accurate? Is that all, not all true? And so, he says, I have sent them into the world, and for their sakes I sanctify myself. I separate myself. Now, if he's asking the Father to separate his disciples by virtue of God's word, his truth, how do you think Jesus would have looked at himself and said, this is what sets me apart? How is it that I am set apart? By God's word. By God's truth. Do you remember when he sat down in the synagogue in Nazareth, as is recorded in Luke, the fourth chapter, he asked for a scroll, which was actually from the prophet Isaiah, and he read from the scroll. And what did he quote? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach. Remember? It's that message that he's saying, that's what has set me apart. And eventually, when he gets through quoting, he sits down and he makes the announcement to the entire synagogue. He says, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your hearing. I am the one anointed of God. I am the one that he has blessed. I am the one that he has loaded, if you will, with his word and with his truth and commissioned me with a message to go out and proclaim that message. That word from the very beginning set Jesus apart. And now he's praying to his father, the same father that sent him out, and he's praying to his father and asking him, now will you bless and sanctify and touch by your truth, by your word, my disciples, my people, as I send them into the world. I have sanctified myself so that they also may be sanctified in truth. He set himself apart. He he, he adhered himself to his father. He dedicated himself to his father's word, to his father's will, to his father's message. And he says, I did that for the sake of these that I have taught, that I have led. Another, in the same passage, he'll say, these are the ones, by the way, O oh father, that you have sent me, that you have sent me. Continuing on in verse 20, I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe on me. I want you to notice the next three words here. Through their word. How is it that the disciples are going to have other disciples that are going to be people that are going to believe in Jesus? How is it that they're going to believe in Jesus? How is it that the disciples of the disciples, if you will, are going to believe in Jesus? How is that going to take place? Through their, what's the last? Word. And what word is it, what message is it that they're going to have, that they're going to, that they're going to proclaim? The same one that Jesus has just prayed that you, Father, would sanctify them with, that you, Father, would bless them with, that you, Father, would give to them to set them apart for purpose. The word of truth, the word of God. They're going to believe on me. They're going to know, but it's going to be based on what? How are, how are we going to become disciples? By the word of God, by truth. And then finally, to finish out uh, 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 that verse and then verse 21, believe on me through their word that they may all be one. That they may all be one. If the word, if the truth is not there, will they be one anyway? The prayer is very specific, is my point. He's really, he's not just, you know, reading words off a script. You know, obviously we know that. But he, he's, not, he's, not, he's not just uh, praying by rote. These are the deep wishes and desires 
of our Lord Jesus Christ that He is pouring out before His Father. He wants fellowship. He wants unity. He wants harmony among His disciples and among the disciples that are going to come as the result of his, the work of His disciples. But notice that all of that is based upon one thing and one thing only and that is the truth which is defined by Jesus as the word of the Father to whom He's praying. As you, Father, are in me, talking about oneness and talking about unity, that they may be one based upon this truth. As you, Father, I in me, and I am in you. Now let me ask you a question. Who do you think came into unity with who? Between Jesus and the Father. Who got on whose page? Who learned from whose playbook? Who followed whose lead? I have not spoken of myself, said Jesus. The Father that taught me. Direct quote. The Father that taught me. Direct quote. He gave me commandment what I should say and what I should speak. So in the transfer of the word of truth, which is the word of God as defined by Jesus, that, how did that chain uh, uh, of possession come? It went from the Father to Jesus who then, who then delivered it to His disciples, ones who were taught. And how is it then that the Father and the Son can be, can be said to be one? They're one because the Son said, I have not spoken of myself, but the Father who taught me, He gave me commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And so I have not spoken of myself, but everything that He has said, I have I, I, commanded me to speak, I have said. I know that His commandment is everlasting, aeonian zoe, aeonian kingdom life. I have spoken it because He taught me to speak it. Who came into oneness with who? The Son came into unity with the Father based upon what? Truth. What does He further expect of His disciples? You come into oneness, you come into unity, you come into harmony with me and my Father on the basis of what? Truth. The Word. And whose Word is it? It's my Father's Word. His Word is truth. You, Father, are in me, and I am in you. May they also be in us. This is a prayer, not a proclamation. Do you understand the difference between those when I say that? This is a prayer, not a proclamation. Jesus doesn't stand up and say before His Father or before anybody. He doesn't stand up and say, And so they shall all be one. Wave a magic wand. There it is. What is it? This is a fancy word I'm about to use, but what is unity as designed by God and as, by, and as implemented by the Son of God? How is unity upon what is unity predicated? Means based. What do you got to have before you got to have unity? Truth. And specifically, when it comes to us, what do you got to have as people? I mean, truth, can, truth is, right? God is light. We're going to read from this same passage, not this, not this particular verse, but you'll recognize it from 1 John, the first chapter, in just a second. God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. If all of the rest of us get together and decide to vote in terms of defining what is light and what is darkness. And we come and we get a 51% majority vote. And let's just say 
there's, you know, what, six billion of us now, I think, currently on the planet. Six billion of us or so on the planet, and we get 51%, so three billion of us and one, we all agree that something is light, but God looks at it and says, that's not light, that's darkness. Do you think God is going to sit there and say, well, you know, there's three billion and one of them, there's only one of me, I guess they win. Doesn't matter, does it? God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all, period. Whether all of us vote the same way He does, if all of us see it the same way as He does, if all of us agree with Him, or if all of us disagree, it really doesn't matter. God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. What we're really talking about here is, are we as people, are we as the creation of God, are we as human beings willing to obey the truth, submit ourselves to the truth of God, and say, we don't have to take votes. We're not interested in defining light and darkness. We believe that, oh God, you have already defined light and darkness. What we're interested in is hearing from you so that you can tell us what light is and what darkness is, and whatever you say, with that, we will agree. We will obey. That's the issue here. For those of such like mind. Who was the first one that would have been uh, of that mindset that I just described? The first one that, have said, uh, that, that would have said, you know, not my will but thine be done. Who was the first one to, to fulfill that perfectly and completely? Was it not our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? He was the first one that said, and we, you know, I quoted it a moment ago, the John 12, uh, for, from, for just a few moments ago, but again, I have not spoken of myself. My Father gave me a commandment what I should say and what I should speak. And the going forward with that, the, the elliptical with that is what? And that's what I've spoken. There you have it. I haven't gone out here and conjured up and thought, oh, I get a message and I'll, I'll do a thing and this will play and this will work and this will help people and this will be what they'll want to hear and this will make them... You know, it, it's interesting, isn't it? it? It's amazing, isn't it? Jesus was not a people pleaser. <clears throat> Jesus was not a people pleaser. Oh, you gotta have some, you know. But at his core, Jesus was a pleaser of his Father. Also in the book of John, the Father has not left me alone, for I always do the things that please him. It's an amazing thing. Truth is the rock upon which the church is to be founded. Truth is the foundation for the fellowship of a people, of a body of people, as designed by God and implemented by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As you, Father, are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So who is, the, who is the we and who is the us? Same book, book of John, quoting of that, I guess, exclusively this morning so far. Book of John, the eighth chapter. Jesus has already defined who the we and the us is in terms of who his disciples are, what makes a disciple, what makes a follower of his. How, how do you know who, who your followers are? How do you know, Jesus? Jesus says very distinctly here in the same book, book of John, Then said Jesus to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my... What is it? Word. And what's the amazingly powerful, incredibly, in English it's only two letters, the incredibly powerful word at the very beginning of this quote of Jesus. 
You know, the little quotation marks start, and then there's the next little two-letter word. It's an amazing, powerful word in our English language. What is it? It's the word if. And what do you use the word if for? If means we got to have, we've got conditions here. We've got one thing that has to happen before another, one, before another one can. The church, as designed by God Almighty, was to be founded upon His truth because He is light and in Him is no darkness at all. His truth was meant to be the defining factor, the foundation for the fellowship. Jesus, His Son, says to his disciples, the ones who want to follow after him. He's already said, I, I've cast my lot with my father. I've put, I, I, I'm following him. I'm doing what he commands. I'm teaching what he says to teach. I'm saying what he says to say. He calls it light, so do I. He calls it dark, so do I. He says, he says this is what we need to do. Jesus says, I say, not my will, but yours be done. He says, if you're going to follow after me, Remember he said long before they had any understanding. He said, if any man will come after me, take up your cross. He must take up his cross and follow me. He was talking about crosses before they had any understanding that he was going to die. Do you understand that? Jesus knew it might cost him to say to his father, not my will, but yours be done. But Jesus was always ready. He says, I'm casting my lot, so to speak, with my Father. If you continue in my word, you're going to walk after me, you're going to have to follow me. Take up your cross if, that, if that's what it requires. Whatever it is, we're standing with the truth of God. Whatever he says, that's what we follow. Whatever he says, that's what defines who we are and why we're here and what sets us apart. What sets us apart is truth. If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples. You recognize from the King James it says my disciples indeed. It really means for real. You really are my disciples. He's being very emphatic there actually in the, in the Greek in the original language. He's saying you are really my disciples if you continue in my word. Then you're really my disciples. And then what flows from that flows from that. It's not independent of it. If you continue in my word, you're really my disciples. If you continue in my word, you will know the truth. Jesus defines clearly what we already read a few chapters away now in John 17. He defines what truth is. Your word, speaking to his Father. Your word, O God, is truth. If you continue in my word, which I got from my Father, when you continue in my word, you're really my disciple. You'll know the truth. And the truth will make you free. He's defined it. By the way, Jesus was just as emphatic about this issue, about God's Word and truth and defining who we are and, and whether we are as people in fellowship with Him, in fellowship with each other, in fellowship with His Father. He's very emphatic about this in John the 8th chapter, same chapter, just a few verses down. Remember, he's, addressed, he's first addressed the people who are believing on him. And he's saying, you stay with me. You continue in my word. But he goes on and what happens? Not everybody was willing to, was willing to number one, believe in him, but number two, continue in his word, were they? They weren't. They opposed him. They didn't like what he had to say. In verse 47, he who is of God... Here's the words of God. And I don't think anybody, anybody, I don't, I don't think even the Apostle Paul would have, been, would have been quite this bold as our Lord Jesus, but he was. Look at what he says. For this reason, you do not hear them. The problem was they were unwilling to obey the word spoken by Jesus of Almighty God. Unwilling. Unwilling. That's the issue, that's the point where, where we have to understand this is our destiny. This is our power. <coughs> this is what lays before us. The power of choice. 
the power of choice. Will we hear? Will we listen? Will we subordinate our own pride and humble ourselves to say, the one who created us knows better than I? You don't hear them because you're not of God, he said. Wow. Let's go to, from the book of John, let's go to 1 John for a second because I want to talk about fellowship. I said what we're talking about is unity in Christ today. And I said that if we don't understand how God himself designed the church, we'll never be the church that God designed. <laughs> Let's talk about fellowship for a minute. Everybody wants to have fellowship. Fellowship is wonderful. Fellowship is great. We, you know, we have churches where we, where we, build, uh, we build an entire thing, and a lot of times we'll call it a what kind of hall? A what kind of hall? A fellowship hall. What takes place in the fellowship hall? Fun! <laughs> Food, we eat, we do. It's, it gets, all the good stuff happens in the fellowship hall. The foundation of whether or not you have fellowship in your church is when you get together and by the Spirit of God there's ministry that takes place. Does that ministry by the Spirit of God deliver to you the Word of truth, the Word of God? If so, guess what? You have fellowship. If the Word of God is present, you have fellowship. I didn't think I was fellowship. I thought I was, I thought I was learning. I thought I was studying. I thought we were reading Scripture. I thought we were hearing something. I thought, I, I, you know, I thought there was some gift of the Spirit. I thought there was some prophetic utterance. I, I, thought, I thought I was... I, I didn't know I was having fellowship. You are. You're having fellowship at that moment. When you are hearing the Word of God, you are having fellowship at that moment. I'm not talking about when you sit down and you eat a meal and we have a good time and we talk and all that and we love each other and all. That's wonderful and powerful. But I'm telling you, you don't realize you're having fellowship when the Word of God is present. How do I say that? How do I get that? Where does that come from? Read this. We declare to you what we have seen and what we have heard. The first two verses refer to what our, eye, what our hands have handled, what our eyes have beheld. The Word of life. The Word of God. And then he's going on to say, this is John in his, in, in his letter here, he's saying, we declare to you what we've seen and what we've heard. We're declaring to you the word of life. We're declaring to you and giving you these things so that, everybody understand those two words, so that. What's that also? It's kind of like that if word. It's conditional. Why are we declaring to you the word of life? Why are we giving you, why are we telling you what we saw, what we heard, what we tasted, what we handled? Why are we telling you these things? So that you may also have fellowship. Wait a minute, I thought we had to go to the fellowship hall to get fellowship. No, you got to go to the word of God to get fellowship. We got to go to the word of God to get fellowship. And if you don't have the Word of God, and if you're not obedient to the Word of God, guess what? You don't have fellowship. Fellowship. Fellowship, by the way, is what? The state of being, of having something in, in common, of holding something together, of being united in something. Fellowship. There's two types that the Apostle John here is going is to uh, highlight for us, and the first one is this one. One is greater than the other. I think they are part of the same <clears throat> they are part of the same fellowship, but one one's a more important aspect of the other, and that's the one he's going to address first. We have delivered to you the word of life. We've declared to you what we have seen and heard, so that your fellowship might be with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. 
How many of you have ever sat down and had covered dish? Fifth Sunday after the fifth Sunday sing-along, how many of you have ever sat down and had covered dish fellowship with our Father and His Son, Jesus Christ? So well, I never thought about it that way. That's the best fellowship you can have. And let me tell you, you don't have to go to the fellowship hall to have it. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them, said Jesus. And when he's in the midst, what do you think he's going to be doing? What do you think the head of the body is going to be doing? I've not spoken of myself. But my Father gave me a command of what I should say and what I should speak. What's he going to deliver to us? By the Spirit of God, what is it that he's going to move in us? The Word of God. And do you understand that when we have the Word of God in the assembly, when we have the Word of God in a congregation, then we have just done something amazing that we don't even always appreciate and realize. We have done something. We have had fellowship with God Almighty and His Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We have had fellowship with them in that moment. But what if we don't have the Word of God? Or, you know, I, I hesitate to say worse yet. I don't know if it, if it really is worse, but in some ways it's even more ironic. What if we have the Word of God, but we won't hear it? Jesus also said a lot of times during his, during his preaching, a lot of times he would say something, he said, he that has an ear, let him hear. Just the truth. But when we do hear and when we do perceive and when we do obey and when we do submit ourselves and we do find humility, guess what we're doing? We're having fellowship with God. That is an amazing thing to have. Talk about setting yourself apart from the world. Do you think most of the world, do you think most of, the, uh, you know, He's created every one of us, but do you think most of us in the world today have any regard for God? Do you think any of the, most of us want to sit down and have fellowship, all fellowship with Him or any other kind of fellowship with Him? Most of them don't care. Most of us don't care. Isn't that sad? But it's true. But for those of us that have the opportunity, for those of us uh, that, 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 that are given the blessing. Oh, how wonderful and how rich it is to be able to have the privilege of fellowship with God. That's pretty good. If you got invited to the White House, I don't care whether you, where, what your politics are. I, I'll, I'll tell you myself right now, if I got invited to the White House today, I would be ecstatic to go and have dinner up there. I would be thrilled. I would, I, I would go. I really would. Compared, though, to the fellowship that is afforded to us, offered to us, with God Almighty, when a people gather together in one mind and in one accord to seek His face, to hear His Word, it's nothing. But notice in verse 7, if we say that we have fellowship with Him, while we are walking in darkness, we do what? We lie and do not the truth. Now he's talking about some, another aspect, which isn't an aspect of true fellowship at all, so we'll put a little asterisk down besides this, but, but we'll call it false. False fellowship. What, is that, what does that imply to you? It says, if I, have, if I say I have fellowship, but I'm walking in darkness, what that means is, what am I transgressing? What am I breaking? What am I, what, what am I getting away from? The foundation of fellowship as God has defined it, and that is truth. If I, I can say I have fellowship, but I'm not on the foundation of truth. I can say I have fellowship with God all I want. But the Apostle John just, just, just called me a liar if I do that. He said, you're a liar. You're lying. You're not being truthful. Because your fellowship is not based upon truth. So what's the lesson then? The lesson is fellowship, again, reinforced from what we, we've been seeing it from Jesus himself and now all the way down in, in, in this letter to the, from the Apostle John. We're seeing over and over again, fellowship has to be founded on truth if it's going to be the true fellowship of God. 
If we walk in the light as He Himself is in the light, then have we, we have fellowship with one another. Oh, we just found out something else. We have the opportunity to have fellowship with God and Jesus Christ. Now we just figured out about true fellowship with each other. We all have to humble ourselves just as our Lord Jesus Christ humbled Himself before God and His Word. We have to. We have to. We must. Because the opportunity is just too great. I know it's uh, cast in a, in a bit of a negative, a negative light this morning, but think for a moment again about the opportunities given to us. If we walk in the light, we walk with God. Think about that. This is one of those things, the next slide, this is one of those things that sounds like Scripture but isn't. There are none so blind as those who heard it will not see. Sounds like Scripture, doesn't it? It's not, actually. It's not. Yeah, it'd been a good one. As one of our old poets has said, there's none so blind as them that will not see. Now I want you to notice this because the apostle here, we're continuing on in 1 John first chapter 9, verse 8. This is very important. Because the apostle is talking about this, this issue about deception. Self-deception, whatever. Deception. We say, you know, we're walking in darkness, but we say, oh, you know, I have fellowship with God. We lie. We don't do the truth. The Apostle Paul in Romans the 15th chapter in verses 5 and 6, he says that there is a harmony that we are to have in the church of God. Again, going back to this idea of this is how God intended His church to be designed and to operate. And it's in accordance, I think, with this where the Apostle Paul talks about accordance. May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another. In harmony with one another. In music, are you familiar with the concept of harmony? F familiar with the concept of harmony? There is somebody in music, if you've got, if you've got voices that are singing, uh, well, the, the girls here that, that sang this morning. You have voices that are singing, and in parts of the song, they're going to sing different parts, harmonies. Somebody is usually going to sing what we call, uh, we certainly hope that somebody is going to sing what we call lead, which is like the, the bass line, the melody, the bass line of the, musical, of the musical arrangement. But what's amazing, what we can also do is we can also have other voices come on, on either side of that, of that main melody lead line part and they can sing other parts which we call harmony. And it's amazing what those, what those are. They're not exactly the same thing that the lead person is singing. They're not the exact same notes, but they are corresponding notes that sound really neat all together. Alto, for example, is a harmony part that someone can sing alongside the lead singer, and it's a neat effect. They're not exactly singing the same thing, but they're singing something similar, and it creates harmony, and it sounds really neat. It sounds better, even, than when you just have one part singing alone. It's an amazing thing. But try to hear someone sing an alto part or a tenor part without a lead line, a lead line singer, a melody part singer, a lead line singer. It sounds weird. 
funny. Just that voice by itself. The power comes when the singers are singing together, quote, in harmony. The point is, it's a cooperation. It takes everyone doing their part. Harmony cannot be one-sided. I can't dwell in harmony with you, Tony, if you are unwilling to have harmony with me. Is that true? Church, is that true? Vice versa is also true. Tony cannot live in harmony with me if I will not have harmony with him. Both of us have to have this, keep up our ends of the harmony agreement, so to speak. We have to. Harmony cannot go one way. It just doesn't work. We got something else going on at that point. We're all singing separate parts. From a church perspective, churches are people. And churches can meet in buildings. Churches can meet in places. You know, in your Bible, in your New Testament, you have a church listed there, one of the churches that Paul writes to, you have a church listed there that is not a church, it's churches. They're all meeting together, but they're not together in harmony. If they were meeting in a roof or in somebody's home or wherever they were, they're, not, they're, not, they're under one roof, but they're not one church. And we look at that and we can say, oh, that's sad. The fact of the matter is, that's not what God intended. That's not what Jesus bled for. It's not the design of God. The design of God is in accordance with this, what He tells the church at Rome. You live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus so that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. With how many voices? With one. Does that mean only one person gets to sing at singing time? No. It, it means that everything that we do, we have to be together, united in harmony, in one accord. And how is it that we're going to be united? What is it that we're going to be based upon? We're going to be based upon all these other factors or all these other measures that are so trivial, really, when compared to the truth, the Word of God. If we're founded upon the Word of God, then we have harmony, or can have harmony. But if we're not going to be founded and we're not going to walk in light, what hope have we? The church is at Corinth. This is one body of people, and yet look at the way they were so divided up. You know all this. Every chapter uh, virtually uh, in, in the book of 1 Corinthians uh, lists another example of where we have one body of people that are just at odds with each other over something. You got one person that, that, that won't that won't do right. You've got you've got one person that, that wants to take somebody to law. You got one you got people that won't they can't eat together. You got this one that'll do this and that one that you got one that says, Well, you know, I'm I'm of Paul. You got one that says I'm of Apollos. You've got you know, this is this is terrible. It's ridiculous. What are they? They are the churches at Corinth. Is that the way God intended them for to be? No. Look at verse 9. This is the first chapter. We're not nine verses into it, and look at what Paul says. God is faithful. By Him you were called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. John said, "We uh, Truly our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We're called to a high fellowship here. And if we can't set our eyes higher and get ourselves above, we will never be the church that God intended us to be. See that? It's true. I don't care. It's true for the Corinthians. It's true for the Ephesians. It's, it's true for the higher groundians of, of the 21st century. It's true for anybody. It's true for all of us. We have to understand these principles and live by them. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement and that there be no divisions among you. Guess what? That's going to take some work between the among you. United in the same mind and in the same purpose. You want to go forward? 
The church that's going to turn the world upside down is not going to be multiple churches under one roof. It's going to be a united fellowship upon, based upon the Word of God. That takes work. This is the same book, and I'm bringing this up in, in 1 Corinthians 12. This is the same book in which Paul gives, uh, one of them, where he, he gives uh, his example of the body of Christ. You are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Remember, he's just listed all this, the eye can't say to the, to the hand, I don't have need of you, and so on. But notice he's bringing this down. But notice this, in, in summary, he says, God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. He's using that as, 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 a, as an encapsulating statement to say, this is why we can't say to each other, we ha to the other one, we don't have need of you because not all of us are the same thing. And guess what? It takes all of us to fulfill the work of God in our day. And he goes on to say in verse 29, are all apostles? He's going to ask all these rhetorical questions. What are the answers to these questions? Every one of them, it's no. Are all, are all apostles? No. But if I'm not an apostle, what does that maybe mean I need? I need the work of one. Are all prophets? The answer to that is, the rhetorical question is, is by context, we would say, no, not everyone. But if I'm not a prophet, doesn't that mean that I would be benefited by one? If it's a true prophet of God, of course. Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? No. Do all speak in tongues? No. Do all interpret? No. But strive for the greater gifts and I will show you a more excellent way. And we know what's going to happen next. He's going to go into this chapter about love. And he's going to say love, among the things he's going to say about love and the love of God the charity of God, the God that, that we can have from Him is that the love that God gives to us rejoices in something. When He, he talks about many things in there, but he, when, when He uses the, the verb rejoices, He applies it to this one thing. He says, love rejoices in the truth. Love has to do with truth. We love the Word of God together. Or we don't. And that's where choice comes in. Back to John the 17th chapter in closing. Love. Unity. Truth. Jesus is still praying to the Father. He says, The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one as we are one. United in purpose, united in faith, united in truth. I in them and you in me, that they may become completely one so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Where does the love of God where is the love of God found? Where does it abide? In the unity that is founded upon truth. That's where the love of God abides. Finally, righteous Father, the world does not know you. If there's anything that the church is supposed to do, the mission of the church is supposed to be, is to be a beacon, a city set on the hill, as Jesus said, for a world that doesn't know God. The church is the instrument, the church is the institution, if you will, in this age that is supposed to be the outpost in this present age, it's the oasis, it's the embassy, it's the outpost for God upon the earth in this age. That's what the church is supposed to be. The people. The fellowship. That's what we're supposed to be. We can't be that. 
if we're not founded and united in truth. Can't. But Jesus' prayer, as we'll see, sums to that. The world doesn't know you, but I know you. And these know that you have sent me, these disciples. I made your name known to them, and I will make it known, so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. Where do you think Jesus is going to manifest himself by the Spirit of God? Where do you think, among, among what people do you think Jesus is going to manifest himself by the Spirit of God? You think he's going to manifest himself among a people that are constantly at odds with one another? That glorify, attempt to glorify his Father through a hundred voices, a thousand voices, a million individual voices, a cacophony of, uh, of competing thoughts, minds, and ideas? Jesus is not going to be able to manifest himself there. It's similar to me, I think, in terms of what it, what it was said, uh, what was it, about Capernaum at one point. Uh, I think it, wasn't it Capernaum? Uh, I'm sorry, it escapes me. It doesn't matter. But one, one, of the, one of the villages there, at one point it says he could do no mighty work there because of their unbelief. And they had a lack of faith. And he says he couldn't do no mighty work there. I think, I think by extension, I think a similar thing could, could be true even now, even in our day and in our time. Maybe Jesus can't do a mighty work even by the Spirit of God. He's in heaven itself, all power in heaven and earth given unto Him. But, but, but maybe He can't do many mighty works in many, in many places because people aren't willing to be founded and united in truth. People aren't willing to live in harmony with one another. People aren't willing to submit themselves, to humble themselves. People aren't willing to, uh, you know, stop being uh, uh, the world's uh, sin greater <laughs> and, and saying, Lord, I need you. First of all, I need you. Help me to change. Help me to be the person you would have me to be. doesn't have to be so. God has designed a mighty church. God has designed a powerful church. His Son, Jesus Christ, loved it so much that He was willing to give His life for it to come to be in existence. That's how much Jesus thinks of the power of a fellowship of believers. Ordinary people like you and me who are willing to humble themselves and found themselves upon the truth of God. The truth is there's more powerful, there's more power at our fingertips than we can possibly imagine. But I hope today you have some bit of a taste. Imagine today what is just at within our grasp as a people. We don't have to be great people. What we have to be is people willing to submit ourselves to a great and mighty God. And the world will change. I believe that. I believe that, don't you? Stand up with me.